Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today we have a family feud between Grand Seiko and Seiko to decide who makes the best value in Japanese professional grade divers. It's the SBGH257 versus the SBDX017. Let's start with the big boy. Launched in 2017, there was a time when you could buy both of these watches new out of the case and this watch was the headline. The first ever Grand Seiko professional grade diver watch. Technically, this is the Grand Seiko high beat 36,000 vibration per hour professional 600 meter SBGH 257. Now the watch is big. 46.8 millimeters on the wrist and you can see that this one really expands on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist it's borderline overkill for any occasion other than professional diving now closing the watch up a bit you can see that it's not terribly broad across the wrist though it is formidable at 16.8 millimeters thick the watch certainly built not just to exclude the ingress of water but also helium gas hence it has no helium escape valve the watch lug to lug is 50.9 millimeters and if you include the solid end links of the bracelet, you're going to find that this one stretches a gargantuan 54.4 millimeters across the wrist with a 23 millimeter spacing for the bracelet end link. So the timepiece is built all of titanium, which Seiko describes as high intensity. In reality, it's roughly equivalent in terms of hardness and brightness to grade 5 titanium as used elsewhere in the industry. Now you can actually see the inserted bars that are used to assemble the bracelet. Wonderful view into the manufacturing process. And both of these watches feature pin sleeves for adjustment of removable links. Also, both of these watches feature an internal extension system that you can deploy while the watch is still on the wrist and contract as you see fit so it's both incremental and a dive extension. Both of them feature several anchoring points in their clasp. Both of them feature trigger release for the clasp and a secondary clamshell to hold tight. The SPGH 257 is a bit more beautifully constructed with a polyhedron case and you can see all of the polished facets are Grand Seiko's celebrated Zeratsu tin plate manual polishing so all of those surfaces are mirror finished and this is a gorgeous case this is almost worth the price of admission by itself the bezel we're going to talk about that and we're going to let it speak for itself in manner of uh, of speaking The detent is crisp, it's sharp, it feels good, and of course the bezel with 120 clicks can be placed quite precisely. The dial is solid iron, a hobnail, but in blue. There was a standard production version of this 500 piece limited edition back in 2017. That's called the SBGH255. This is the 257. 500 of these with that blue iron hobnail dial. 600 meters water resistant, and I mentioned helium proof such that you don't need a helium escape valve. Special seals enable this watch to resist any helium ingress during saturation dives. You can see the case back is solid but handsome with a combination of blasted background and relieved and polished Grand Seiko logo and lion. Inside the case, Grand Seiko, manufacturer caliber 9S85, high beat, 55 hour power reserve, 37 joules, adjusted in six positions, one more than a standard chronometer. Stop seconds, quick set date, and guaranteed from the factory, a precision of no worse than minus three plus five seconds per day. Now let's talk about the Marine Master. Let's talk about the SBDX 017. Properly speaking, since we are on a full name basis with these watches, this is the Seiko Prospects Marine Master Professional 300 meter SBDX 017. 44 millimeters in stainless steel compared to the 46.8 of the Grand Seiko. It is simply inherently a more wearable watch. As you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the lug to lug spacing makes this far easier to ship on a standard size human forearm. The watch is only 15 millimeters thick, so significantly slimmer, but it seems even slimmer still. Lug to lug, it's 50.4, and it's a bit shorter end link to end link at 53 millimeters, but the effect of all of those nips and tucks is a far smaller watch that you feel you could wear every day. The spacing between the lugs is 20 millimeters. Both of these watches feature a set of lug apertures that are strap friendly, but here's the thing. Both of the watches also 
come with a factory bracelet that should be your first choice as it's handsome, rugged, and versatile. Now, one area in which Grand Seiko opens no gap to Seiko is the fabrication of the bracelet, which here, in stainless steel to match the case, feels just as tough, as handsomely executed as the Grand Seiko. And because we are talking Seiko versus Grand Seiko titanium, Grand Seiko steel always features screw-fixed removable links. Both watches feature pin sleeves. Since the architecture of the clasp is likewise identical, you have the clamshell system, you have the incremental sizing apertures, you have the system that allows you to pull out a full extension or incrementally size, and you have the combination of the clamshell and the triggers. All of that feels better and price appropriate on this $2,600 retail timepiece in a way that it really doesn't on the Grand Seiko. We'll zoom out one more time and get an impression of this one on the wrist, and you can see that it really does fit a whole lot better. 300 meters water resistant, but because of monoblock case construction, it has the same helium gas ingress resistance that you find on the Grand Seiko, meaning for practical purposes, these watches are identical as divers. If you're going beyond 300 meters, you're probably not relying on a mechanical dive watch as your primary. So functionally, I don't see a real difference between these two. The bezel is superb. I actually find this one to be a little bit more refined. You be the judge from what you can hear. It doesn't sound as crunchy, but it reminds me, in a way the Grand Seiko doesn't, of Rolex or a Blancpain 50 Fathoms. It really does seem like there's a refinement beyond the standard crisp detent of any given dive watch. There's something about this bustle that feels more expensive. And again, speaking of expense, this watch, $2,600 versus this watch, $9,800, both of them with ADLC, amorphous diamond-like carbon-coated bezels. Neither one of them features ceramic, but once again, it feels more appropriate on the $2,600 watch. So let's talk about advantages, and we'll start the way we started the video with the 257. This is a handsome timepiece and a rare one. 500 pieces of these are being constructed against 2015, 16, 17, and 18 production for the SBDX 017. That watch is discontinued, but it was never limited production. Many are extant. The watch also features far more impressive caliber spec. An extra five hours of power reserve at 55 hours, a higher beat rate at 36,000 vibrations per hour. The watch is also adjusted in six positions and guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus five seconds per day, whereas the SBDX 017 with its Seiko 8L35, which may be Grand Seiko derived, but nevertheless only offers 50 hours of power reserve and guaranteed precision of no worse than minus 10 seconds plus 15 seconds per day. So that's the standard for the Seiko. The Grand Seiko is far more accurate and deluxe. I'll also mention that if you do need that extra margin of safety, hey, the spec sheet doesn't lie. 600 meters versus 300 meters. You may never need it, but luxury is about getting more than you need. I'll also mention that the timepiece has artisanal finish about the Zeratsu polish of its case band. It is a beautifully made thing, handcrafted externally in a way that the Seiko simply isn't. So if you believe that a luxury product should have at least some artisanal handcraft, you're going to want to go with the SBGH 257. Finally, it does have a degree of anti-magnetism that the SBDX-017 does not have. That has a basic anti-magnetic ferrous hairspring, which is 4800 ampere per meter resistant, but because of this solid iron dial, this watch is 16,000 ampere per meter resistant, so it's a bit more robust, and if you look at the dial at close range, the SBGH257 with that blued iron hobnail, the quality of the finishing on the satin finished hands and the polished indices, it is significantly higher than what you'll find on the Marine Master. The Marine Master is good, but the Grand Seiko looks its price. That's the one place where you really do see the difference in price borne out by the quality of what's in the hand. Now let's talk about the Marine Master Pro. The Prospects Marine Master Pro, of course, launched in 2015, discontinued in 2018, is a lovely piece that sells new for $2,600, but you have to be impressed by its store of value factor, as these in good condition sell for about three to three and a half thousand dollars today. If you were to buy the 257 for 9800 you'd find that these trade for about 7500 to 8000 Good value retention, but it's nothing like the SBDX, which actually sees a bit of gain on secondary markets. It's also far more wearable. Although they're relatively close in nominal size, you can really see the difference when they're adjacent crystal to crystal. The Marine Master is just easier to wear on the wrist. So it's gonna be more versatile and it's gonna be an everyday watch. I'm not sure that the Grand Seiko Pro can be that. 
Also important to note that the quality of the bracelet and the clasp seems far more understandable and appropriate on a watch that costs a fraction of the Grand Seiko. Remember, the Grand Seiko is priced at about 3.8 times the price of this SBDX017, and everything I see here feels more expensive than $2,600 whereas almost everything I see here, bracelet and clasp-wise, feels far below the price of entry of almost 10 grand. So on that basis, value, advantage, Marine Master. Let's also talk a little bit about the presence of an ADLC bezel on both of them. If you're not gonna give me ceramic, don't charge me ceramic bezel prices. Again, price appropriate on the SBDX, it just seems like it belongs. So let's talk about the monoblock case, a cool construction method that Grand Seiko has historically consistently featured in the lineup. It's a bit of a brand signature. It makes the watch, in reality, technically more fascinating from an assembly standpoint and also likely in the real world just as tough as the Grand Seiko. So which one do I prefer? Well, you know, I love myself a blue dial, and I'm all about artisanal craft and watchmaking, which the Grand Seiko both offer. But from a value standpoint, I'm more impressed by the Prospect Marine Master. This is a watch that's more wearable with a more versatile size. It's a watch that is an honest product, honestly priced. And it's nice, if you do manage to pick one up at list, you could actually sell it down the road for what you paid, which is a nice way to own a watch without really suffering any of the economic repercussions of our hobby, and we know them well. Also, it feels more expensive than it is, whereas the Grand Seiko feels at best its price, at worst, like 9800 is simply too much money to be asked for the quality on offer. I'll also mention that this watch is probably functionally equivalent, and if you're okay with resetting your watch every week or two, you won't even worry about the differential between the two movements in outright precision. Finally, I've lined them up side by side in the dark, and I found that the Prospects Marine Master has significantly better loom at night, so on a utilitarian basis, Advantage Seiko, one up on Grand Seiko. This time it's the little brother that wins the race. Sometimes bigger is not better, Grand Seiko. The Marine Master for the win. Guys, let me know in the boxes below which one of these would be your choice. Seiko, Grand Seiko. Seiko, Grand Seiko. I feel this, that the Seiko has fatter loomed hands and index. You can also see that the bezel pearl is larger on the Seiko than on the Grand Seiko.